Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Last week we talked a little bit about salt and light. So if you weren't here, too bad. No. Of course not. Just kidding. The sermon is available in podcast, audio, and video form on our website. But since we discussed light and salt last week, Today's sermon is going to be based primarily on the second half of our gospel text, verses 17 through 20. So here are those verses again. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until it is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of these of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven but whoever does not does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven for I tell you unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees you will never enter the kingdom of heaven so today we will address three main points that come out of this text Christ came to fulfill, not abolish the law. Teaching, teaching the law is very important, and our righteousness must be greater than that of the scribes and the Pharisees in order to get to heaven. All three of these points have a common root, an understanding of the law, and to better understand the law would help us to better understand these points. So I think we should spend a little time maybe in almost a Sunday school fashion, talking about the law. Many will condemn God and his law because they misunderstand and misrepresent it. God's word has laws for slavery. Does that condone slavery? God's word records polygamy, multiple marriages, multiple wives. Does that condone polygamy? God's word records a lot of history. And when you record a lot of history, it's going to contain a record of a lot of human sin. A record of sin is not an approval of sin. Polygamy is sinful because it's a violation of the Sixth Commandment. And laws on slavery do not necessarily condone it, but acknowledge that it existed in that day, and therefore God made rules to address it, civil laws to address it in that society. Now notice I use the word civil law. If we understand God's law in a threefold way, ceremonial, civil, and moral, it can shed some light on what Christ meant when he said, I have not come to abolish but to fulfill the law. This threefold understanding of the law, while not a firm doctrine like the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, is very helpful in applying God's law and understanding it. It's timeless and changeless nature, helping us to better teach it, helping us to better live it. Judaism recognizes distinctions in the law as well. God's divine law consists of commandment and statute and judgment, derived from different Hebrew words used in different contexts. Understanding this can also be help helpful in figuring out which is which. But I think we'll forego the Hebrew lesson today. Let's look at these threefold understanding, this threefold understanding starting with the ceremonial law, customs of a nation or statutes, of a religious nature, sacrifice, dietary restrictions, ceremonies, feasts, and festivals, clothing, Sabbath, circumcision, Passover, and the redemption of the firstborn. These and many more were just as much a part of the law of the nation of ancient Israel as any other part. But they were and are ceremonial laws, helping to distinguish between clean and unclean, holy and unholy, distinguishing God's people from the people that surrounded them, all in some way pointing to the promised Messiah pointing to and or foreshadowing Christ. 
the sacrifice that he made for us all. Christians are not bound by most ceremonial laws. These laws have not changed. They are still in effect. However, Christ has fulfilled what they were designed to point to, to him, what he is, and they foreshadowed that. So when they contain a moral aspect, that moral aspect continues. Worship weekly is a moral principle that Christians follow. But we don't worship on Saturday, and that's what the third commandment says. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. It's talking about the seventh day. It's talking about Saturday. But we follow the moral principle of weekly worship by celebrating the resurrection every Sunday. The church is not the nation of ancient Israel. And notice I refer to it as ancient Israel because the Israel in the Old Testament is not the Israel of today. They are two different nations altogether. Galatians 3, 23 to 25 explains that since Jesus has come, Christians are not required to sacrifice or circumcise. Colossians 2, 16 and 17 and Romans 14, 5 explain that Jesus has fulfilled the Sabbath and become our Sabbath rest. So it is not that these laws have changed, their purpose is fulfilled. And we follow them by acknowledging that Christ fulfilled them. Let's look at civil law. These laws were specifically given for ancient Israel, that nation. They also include the moral laws. For, so it's sometimes hard for us to figure out what's what. So that this distinction wouldn't come until after the nation of Israel ceased to exist. We are not citizens of the nation of ancient Israel any more than we are nation, citizens of German, French, Brazilian, or South American laws. Those who are in these nations must follow the laws in those nations, those who live there in that time and that place. However, again, any moral principles contained in any of these civil laws are timeless and continue. Many nations have civil laws about murder. But this is also a moral law. It's a violation of the fifth commandment. While laws about slavery and mixing grains and fibers and fashion regulations do not apply to us. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that all of the law is useful for instruction. But while these ceremonial and civil laws that apply to ancient Israel pointed to Christ and are beneficial for us to learn and understand about who he is and what he came to do, teaching us how God progressively reveals himself to his people. We do not have to regulate our lives or any, or any of these laws except for the ones that carry moral principles. Finally, let's look at how we would define a moral law. Moral law, laws are direct commands of God, like the Ten Commandments. Moral laws reveal the nature of God and his will for us, and they apply today. God's revealed will for humanity, his moral laws, his guidelines for living, and when the civil laws <coughs> of our land cross the moral line, we then have to speak the truth and love about our God and his laws when the laws of our land cross that line. So if we want to know if our actions conform to God's will, we simply hold up his clear moral guidelines and see if our actions are in accord with his divine will. Do our actions make him the one and only God in our lives? Do our actions reflect his holy nature? And are a positive reflection of his name in our community? Does our week have a regular time of worship and prayer? And is teaching his truth a regular part of our daily lives? Do our actions reflect an appreciation for the gift of authority in our lives? Do our actions respect, reflect a respect for the sanctity of human life? 
Do our actions foster and show care and support for God's design of one man and one woman marriage? Do our actions reflect respect and care for the property of others? Do our actions reflect a respect for and concern for the reputation of our neighbor? And do we seek with God's help to be content with the people and things in our lives that he's blessed us with? We do not only try to live our lives in accord with his will, but we teach and share this truth as well with others. Our righteousness must be greater, says the text, than that of the scribes and the Pharisees if we want to enter heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. If there was anyone in the nation of ancient Israel who had the appearance of doing God's will, the scribes and the Pharisees would be the ones who had that appearance. But our good works must be more than an appearance of righteousness. They must be righteous to the core. And the only way that anything we do can be righteous to the core if it is, if it is washed and sanctified and made holy by the blood of the Lamb. Teaching the law is also very important. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I'd like to point out that being called least in the kingdom of heaven does not imply that you are in heaven. You can be called least and not be there, but be in the other place. This is actually a play on words that even translates well into English. Relaxing the least causes you to be called the least. And to relax on any command is to break it. The moral commands, the ones I was talking about earlier. There is no fence sitting here. We don't get to sit on the fence. You are hot or cold, in or out. Holy or unholy, clean or unclean. In light or in the darkness. There is no such thing as being just a little bit pregnant. People who are a little bit pregnant are called parents, regardless of how microscopic their children are. Property is yours or it is not. A little lie is 100% a lie. When we refuse to repent or refuse to forgive, <clears throat> and refusal to repent or forgive rejects forgiveness altogether. And while we can make a clear distinction between ceremonial, civil, and moral laws, we all fall short. We are all guilty. God's law is like one solid piece of safety glass, and if you put a small crack in the corner, the whole thing shatters and is destroyed. But that which we destroy, Christ makes whole again. Remember, Christ came to fulfill, not abolish the law. And again from Matthew's words, do you think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets? I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all has been accomplished. Until all is accomplished, the law and the prophets have been fulfilled. The law has been fulfilled. He paid for our sins on the cross. God's just nature has been satisfied on the cross. In the blood of his own perfect, loving, full, law-abiding son. There is yet one prophecy to be fulfilled. Before one dot or one iota will pass from the law, his triumphant return on the last day, when we will all be raised, spiritual and physical combined again, joining Christ in eternal paradise. In Jesus' name, amen.